That's great. I don't know what I did to not scare you all off from me talking for the last time I was up here, but apparently it wasn't good enough. So here I am again. Something about teaching a class, I want every one of you to understand. Everybody should get up and teach a class. It will force you into the Word. It will make you study more. It gets you out of your routine study and gets you into a different study. And so I encourage everybody to always, if you get an opportunity, to get up and teach a class. Doesn't matter how good or how bad you do, because it's about your getting into the Word. That's what it's all about. So, uh, and everybody comes up with different ideas. My ideas are not y'all's, but y'all get to listen to mine. So. Have y'all ever felt defeated? Anybody? Felt defeated? Felt lost? Felt like you need a redo today? What do they call it in golf whenever you need a redo? I don't even remember the term, but there's one. Uh, a mullet. I'm sorry, that's what it is. I need a mullet. <clears throat> ever had the days that nothing is going your way? I've been underneath cars trying to get a bolt loose, and I just so frustrated, and just have to get out, and walk away. How about have you ever been bullied? Has everybody made fun of you or pushed you around? I have been. Starting in grade school, I was bullied. I was too tall. I was too skinny. I was too dumb. I was too shy. I was a little bit of a nerd back then. I'm not quite as bad today. But I was also socially inept. I wasn't able to understand the cues that the other kids gave. Because I was raised a little different. I was raised to accept everybody for what they are. And that made a big difference in my life because I didn't care about what you were. I cared about how it affected me. Whenever I was in the, working in the police department, while I was a, in corrections as an officer in the prison, I was bullied. I had other staff come up to me and say, why are you making our job so hard? Just let it go. Had the same thing in police work. Why are you making the job so hard? You don't have to worry about all those speeders out there. You don't have to worry about that person that's going through the school zone too fast. My answer to that was, then you explain that to the man's family that I picked up where a car ran over him, and he was a crossing guard. There are reasons why we do things. How about have you ever lost somebody? Mother, father, brother, sister, spouse, child? We've all had a loss. I think that in in our own ways, and at every one of us at some point has had something like that happen to us. And I want to clarify something too, because I say this a lot in here, I think. Whenever I say I think, y'all better watch me real close because it might not be right. Last week I was watching an old western called Laramie. Any of y'all remember that show? In it, uh, on this particular day, the show, they were being attacked by Indians. They had the chief's son that they had accidentally shot, and he died. And so the Indians were seeking revenge, and they're coming after him. And they were knew they were going to die. There just wasn't any hope for them. Any of y'all ever felt that way? There just didn't any hope? It's the end? Well, in part of this, they sang a song, and it's called Swing Low, Sweet Chariot. And some of y'all remember it. It was in our songbooks way back when, but it's not anymore. And you might understand why as we go through the lesson, but uh, it's an interesting song to me, and I love it. And we're going to talk about the words to it here in just a minute and some of the things about it. Uh, the words that I'm going to read are from uh, Etta James, 
she sang the song in 2005, if you know who Etta James is. She's a soul singer, and this is uh, her version of the words, and they're pretty close to the original words. There may be a few, course, uh, few lines added in, but it's pretty close. Swing low, sweet chariot, coming for to carry me home. Swing low, sweet chariot, coming for to carry me home. I looked over Jordan, and what did I see? Coming for to carry me home. A band of angels coming after me, coming for to carry me home. Sometimes I'm up, sometimes I'm down, but still my soul feels heaven bound, coming for to carry me home. The brightest day that I can say, coming for to carry me home, when Jesus washed my sins away, coming for to carry me home. If I get there before you do, coming for to carry me home, I'll cut a hole and pull you through, coming for to carry me home. If you get there before I do, coming for to carry me home, tell my friends I'm coming too, coming for to carry me home. Swing low, sweet chariot, coming for to carry me home. Swing low, sweet chariot, coming for to carry me home. So a little bit of history about this song, and we'll tie it in. Nobody knows who actually wrote the song. It is given credit to a slave, and interestingly enough, he was the slave of a Choctaw Indian. Um, some history in there that I didn't know. The Choctaw Indians had about 20,000 slaves. I think that's the number that's right. I never realized in, in our history that we're taught that the Indians owned slaves. I, I knew that they captured people and had them as slaves, but never realized that. So, two thoughts on this song about where it came from, though. One of them is from, again, an African-American slave song that has a coded message about the uh, Underground Railroad. And that is attributed to a eastern, uh, or a, I'm sorry, a deep south, but more eastern uh, group of people that believe that. But the more reliable one, and to the person that is given credit to writing the song, as I said, he was a Choctaw Indian slave. This song was originally done in Choctaw. They sang it, not as what we would understand it. It was her. It was translated into English, and get, and then given to a college that was teaching freed slaves to go out and teach. And that then it, that's where it became more public. They did. Uh, um, they did it in part of their repertoire as a choir, and the the college that was doing that was lo had no money. They actually gave the last $50 in the budget for their choir to go out and sing to try to get support. And because they added the religious songs into their repertoire, they started getting money into the college. So it, it's a lot of interesting things about this song. Um, but whenever I'm thinking about the words of the song, I'm thinking about, is this a defeated song? Whenever I'm thinking about that show, they sang that because this was their last. It's gone. We're done. And I may be wrong. It may not be what they intended it to be, but that's the way I felt it was in the show. So I got to thinking, just like that TV show where it was the end for them, don't we see that today? Hurricanes, flooding, forest fires that are burning acres of land, earthquakes that are killing thousands of people, disease, famine. Anything else that we can tell you about it? What else is going on in the world? Politicians. Okay. So it's the end, right? There's nothing more for us. Nobody will argue with me on that? Come on, y'all. <laughs> I don't agree with that way of thinking, okay? 
I think that the song shares things that talk to us about our lives. So, I found on a website called Shmop, S-H-M-O-O-P, or shmoop.com. It's a, a website that has uh, materials for teaching. And this song was analyzed, and so that's where I got all the history from about the song. Um, and I'm going to go through parts of it. And it, what I'm going through is highly edi edited because it was written for a non-secular or a secular group wasn't, wasn't for a church or anything like that. It was for classes. So the first part of the song, Swing Low, Sweet Chariot, coming for to carry me home. Any idea where that came from? Elijah in a chariot went home. Anybody know that story? Nobody's shaking their head. Y'all don't remember Elijah being taken up in a fiery chariot? <laughs> I mean, I would think that a fiery chariot would catch our attention. <laughs> um, so, briefly the story. Elijah scolds who? King Ahab and Queen Jezebel. Does that bring any bells? Anybody, is a picture coming back through? Ultimately, Ahab and Jezebel were killed because of what they had done against God. And Elijah was carried to heaven in his, this fiery chariot. He is the only human, I think this is right, um, John can correct me, but he is the only human that we know of that went to heaven without dying first. Enoch. Enoch. Okay. So, the two that we know of. Um, so, while this is definitely out of the Old Testament, um, we find the reference to heaven in this song. So, what's heaven to us? Home? Libby, what did you say? Resting place. Um, we believe that that's our what? Our destination. We believe that's where we live. We're just passing through here trying to go home to heaven. All right, so I looked over Jordan and what did I see coming for to carry me home? If you look in the Old Testament, it was the fiery chariot. But if you move on down into the New Testament, uh, the reference to Jordan is what to us? Say it loud enough, I can hear. It's a river, but it's the, the what? A division. We cross the River Jordan to go home. It's, it's the division. So I looked over that division. And what did I see coming for to carry me home? It goes back to Elijah. And he crossed the river. Y'all remember how he crossed the river? Okay, how did Moses cross the river? He separated the sea. How did he do that? took his staff, right? So Elijah took his cloak and struck the water, and it parted for him to cross over. Why was he crossing over? Escape. Escape. He was going into the Jordan Valley to anoint his, 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 his successor. He was done. Elijah was through. He had done his time. He crossed over and anointed Elisha. Kind of interesting when we get into it. He's on his way home, and he still appointed somebody to take after him and to, to continue on. Um, 
the band of angels, well, let's go back just a little bit. The, char the fiery chariot went up to heaven in a whirlwind. So that's following the scripture. So the next part of the song goes, a band of angels coming after me, coming for to carry me home. So the songs kept pretty close to Old Testament, but now let's go to New Testament. Where do we find something about a band of angels that are coming after me? Any ideas? Well, if you look at a, uh, the chariot, chariots drawn by horses, and it's talking about, and we find a lot of references to horsemen, but not angels in this part of the, the Bible again. But if we think about horsemen, this was kind of a, a downer on the song to me. What are one of the places that we, that we think of the horsemen in the Bible? Revelation. Revelation. Four horsemen. And they're the carriers of conquest, war, famine, death. They wreak havoc. So, would you think that the, and, and this was a point about the song, the gentleman that wrote the song, don't you think he tamed it down a little bit? That it wasn't horsemen that, that were there to carry him home? Because we're not talking about the defeat. We're not talking about the destruction. He's talking about salvation. So he changed the words a little bit into uh, a band of angels coming after me. I got to looking for the band of angels, and there's several of them. But when we're told that Christ comes again, what does it say? And who will be with him? He will come with his angels. So there's our, our angels coming for to carry me home. We can tell that in the song that the songwriter pretty well knew the Bible. He knew his Old Testament for sure. We also know that from history that the songs of this type were never written down. They were passed on verbally. So they changed here and there, depending upon who, who sang it. Um, so again, I believe this song is about a victory, not a defeat. And I go back to that TV show and I think about they sang that as being defeated. And I'm going, we're not defeated. So again, I'm going to ask uh, a few questions, and this is going to be a very short class tonight. I'm almost out of notes. I got one more page left. Wow. Where is home? Heaven. Heaven. So how are we going to get there? Through the sacrifice of Jesus' blood, but a little more literally, let's look at Thessalonians 4, 16 through 17. For the Lord Himself will come down from heaven with a shout of command, and with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be suddenly caught up together with them in the clouds and meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. That's how we're going to get to heaven. Doesn't matter if we're still alive or if we've passed away. He's going to come and He's going to raise us up and take us with Him. So the next part of this is is with all the things we've talked about that's wrong with the world today, are we supposed to worry about that? Why not? 
God's in control. Well, let's look at Matthew 24. And we're going to read um, from verse 1 down through verse 14. And it's going to tell us quite a bit. Jesus left the temple and was walking away with it when His disciples came to, up to Him and called His attention to the buildings. So why would they call His attention to the buildings? Of the temple. They were beautiful. And Jesus answered to them, Do you see all these things? He asked. I tell you the truth, not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. So, He's telling them right there, don't think about the physical. Don't think about the beauty of things. And with verse 3, continuing, As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to Him privately. Tell us, they said, when will this happen, and what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? And Jesus answered, Watch out that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, claiming I am the Christ, and will deceive many. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. We worry about wars today, don't we? Why? What did it just tell us? It just told us, don't worry about it. <clears throat> kind of hard to do sometimes. But it's important that we understand and we trust. Because if we can't trust Him, then we have nothing. So we have to, to believe in that. Continuing with verse 6, So things must ha happen, but the end is still coming. Nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All of these are the beginning of birth pains. Then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death, and you will be hated by all nations because of me. Are we ready for that, y'all? Are we ready to be persecuted? It's a little closer than we might want to think. There are some laws that would say Sean is a criminal and needs to go to jail because he preaches. Just because he's a preacher. And people are trying to push those laws through. Hasn't happened yet. But in other countries, if you have a Bible, you're subject to prison or death. We're fortunate in America, but we have to all think about that because it could come. And we need to know that even if it comes, God is in control. He will take care of us. Verse 10, In that time many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. Again, I ask you, are we ready to be persecuted? Can we stand up and hold our faith? It's hard. As I told you, while I was in the prison, I was persecuted, I was bullied. Some of it was because of my faith. But let me tell you, as many as got on to me because of my faith came to me and said, I saw you at church service last night and you took communion. That speaks to me. So we don't ever know. We have to be sure that we're taking care of it right and that we never lose our faith. Continuing with verse 11, And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Because of the increase of wickedness, wickedness the love of most will grow cold. But he who stands firm to the end will be saved. 
And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. I'm ready for the end. I'm secure in where I'm going to be. I think everybody in here is. But the question comes into, if we are pushed, if we are bullied, if we're picked on, if we believe that the world has turned against us, will we be a victor or will we be defeated? So each of us has to answer that. Now, I will tell you, in law enforcement, I was trained to shoot a person and to kill them dead. We were told never to put it that way. We always shoot to stop. No, we're stopping them as permanently as we can. I came close to doing that a couple of times. I chased some kids. Well, they were chased from Canyon to Plainview, and I chased them from Plainview to Abernathy. And then they tried to run over me with the car. And I got out of the patrol car, drew my gun, and was thinking one shot to take out the windshield, second shot to take out the driver, and I was pulling the trigger. Do you know why I remember that so well? It made me worry if I, how I would have reacted if I'd actually shot him. Could I live with myself? I've actually had people come up to me, though, on the other hand, and say, we don't think we can put you in this job over here because you might have to shoot somebody, and we don't think you as a Christian could do that. So, kind of a balance. I know that my training would have kicked in and I could have shot somebody. What had happened afterwards, I can't answer that. If we are persecuted, really and truthfully persecuted, we cannot say what we will do. We can say, this is what I want to do. This is what I believe I'll do. But until somebody actually pushes us, and I'm not talking about a little ribbon about your religion. I'm not talking about the easy things. I'm talking about really comes after us. You're going to prison because you teach this. You have a Bible. We're going to burn your house and or we're going to take your house and burn all your belongings. Really, truthfully, take everything away from us. What do we believe would do and what we do may be different. And none of us can really know that until the time happens. So one of my prayers, or one part of my prayers, personal prayers, is that I will always be able to stand for the Lord. That I will never lose that faith. And I hope that y'all are the same way, that y'all put that in your faith. So kind of back to our song. Well, one more question I had. Uh, is why we don't have songs like Swing Low, Sweet Chariot. And even though I understand these were slave religious songs, and so it is not culturally correct for us to be singing these. But those people were going through trial, tribulation, and they held their faith, and they expressed it through song in their work, in their daily life, and in their worship service. How about us? Do we sing praises to God every day? Do we turn on the, the religious radio and sing with the songs that come on? A lot of us do. How many of us, I'm guilty on this one, get in the car and turn on 550 talk radio and listen to everything that's on there? That's the wrong thing to do, I, and I scold myself for it. I, it's not wrong to keep up with the news, but to listen to it and get in tied into it, I have a sister who is tied into all that stuff that just, and it happens to be the one I'm going to Dallas and doing all the work for. I don't even want to try to get into conversations with her. She's interesting, knows a lot, but 
between uh, you have to eat the right foods and you can't do this, you know, I can't go have my milkshake every day because it's not good for my losing weight uh, and it's not ice cream, you know, it's bad for you and you need to get away from milk and I'm going, <laughs> that part of my life I can live with. And why? Why can I be that way? Because God says he'll take care of me. If I get cancer and I die from cancer, what makes me different than somebody that was thrown in the lion's den? Does that make any sense to y'all? God is in control. I may face trials and tribulations, and what are we told about when we have a trial? It's a test of our faith. Thank you. That's what we need sometimes, is some testing of our faith. And, and most of y'all know this. So 2019 to 2020 was not a good year for me. Lost my wife the weekend of my birthday. Six months later, six, seven months later, I got COVID and was in bed for a month. Couldn't get medical help, couldn't stay awake to call for medical help. Had a 16 year old that had no clue what to do other than bring me water and jello every now and then. Things did not go well for me. But God tested me. Job is one of my greatest books in the Bible to me. If I was ever tested. So, Libby and Ron know this, but my son was born without an immune system. Whenever he was 18 months old, his life expectancy was seven years old. We just happened to find a doctor that had a treatment. At seven, they had raised his life expectancy to 19. At 19, he had responded to the medication so well, they said that if he can keep the treatment going, his life expectancy is now as long as your family would live. So that could be 80, 90 years old, as long as he can keep doing the treatment. So we looked at losing, and we went through the depression, and I told my wife, I said, honey, this can't beat us, but what we learn about this, because we have college education, we are teachers, we can teach others how to deal with it, and that's what we did. And we took people to the doctor that couldn't figure out what their child was so sick all the time. We told them the questions to ask the doctors. Actually, Sheila did. But we turned something that could defeat us, could turn us away from Christ, into a victory. We're not going to do that. So, again, what makes it to where we know that it's a victory for us? It's our faith in knowing that God had a plan. He set it in motion. He sent us a Savior to be our sacrifice. And one little part about being that sacrifice, we talk about the blood of Jesus. I had a gentleman that talked, a doctor actually gave a talk about the crucifixion. They pierced Jesus' side. They pierced Jesus' side, and blood ran out. Where they pierced him in a dead body, there should have been no blood. From a medical standpoint, but yet blood ran out for us. He sweated blood. Any of y'all ever sweated blood? 
There's these little capillaries up in here that actually if you are stressed enough, they will rupture and you will sweat blood. You don't think that Jesus worried about us and what was happening? He was under a lot of stress for that to happen. Several things had to come together that were miraculous for Him to have bled for us. Because whenever you hang somebody up on a cross, you literally, they will drown. And in trying to do that, the lung will rupture, and that's where the blood will come from. Kind of medical science going along with it. So, we've got His blood where it shouldn't be. A dead person should not bleed out of their lung, but yet He did. Thinking about how wonderful a gift that was to us. The excruciating pain that He went through. So I'm going to ask this, what's the worst pain any of y'all ever went through? Kidney stones for me. I've had gallbladder trouble, I've had appendicitis, I've had all kinds of other stuff, but kidney stone put me on the floor crying. And I've been beat up a few times in my life pretty bad, but that was the worst pain I'd ever had. But think about the worst pain you ever went through. Magnify it by four or five hours with nothing for pain. That's a great thing that Jesus did for us and God set up for us. And we don't think about that all the time, but it's a celebration as well as a sadness to know about that. So, again, I go back to the song. How many of us want us to have a chariot swing low to pick us up? How many of us would like to have the privilege to be so well thought of by God that He sends a chariot and takes us to heaven? How about just have a band of angels coming after me? We're promised that. He's going to come with His angels. That's pretty well the conclusion of the lesson. We've still got a few minutes left. So, anything y'all want to talk about, any ideas y'all have about that, discuss the lesson. Tell me how bad I did so Sean won't call me back. <laughs> <laughs> any, any thoughts though really our time in trials we've not had in years I don't know of anybody in here that has really gone through persecution to be a Christian and again I ask are we ready to do that we are persecuted in the world though a little bit we're picked on, bullied sometimes, but are we ready? Are we ready to, to stand? Can we say we really are? And this is the older group. Think about the trouble the younger people will have. We have to be their strength and show them what it's about. We have to stand firm and we have to know our, our lessons and our Bible enough to say this is why. Because I can almost guarantee you that a lot of the younger people out in the world, they do not care that they're going to heaven. They care about their music and where their next meal is coming from. And a lot of them may be about what clothes they get to wear. Because they want their friends to look at them. So have we prepared them for what's coming? And if y'all think back, we have a lot more trouble now than we did 30 years ago. We have more problems. Or do we? There have always been wars. There's always been famine. Nothing has changed except 
news. We hear it immediately now. So how do we stay vigilant to that? How do we protect ourselves from that? Can't do that. We need to know what's happening out there. And there's a reason why we need to know what's happening. So we can pray about it. Yes, Libby. Whenever I, I, I was coming here and I volunteered to be on part of the security group, one of the things that I said is that 20 years ago, we wouldn't have thought of bringing a gun into the churches because our faith would take care of us. If God wanted us to die at that time, then that would happen. But now it's we're going to bring certain people with weapons in to protect the group. I have a sister that says that's wrong. And I, my answer to her was, well, a centurion was baptized and he didn't retire, or we're not totally retired. He stayed a centurion. A centurion is over how many soldiers? So, you know, it, it's kind of personal choices on that. And it, it comes down to, again, to what is our, our faith and how does it lead us? Can we be Daniel in the lion's den? Is that right? It's Daniel, right, in the lion's den? <laughs> well, y'all kind of gave me a blank look. I'm going, oops, did I miss it? <laughs> Um, you know, can we have the faith that says, if God wants me dead, he'll take me. Because it's not, I'm going to die. I get to go to heaven. So if y'all ever had somebody ask you, how are you today? And you go, I, I'm breathing or I'm alive. And they say, well, that's better than the alternative. Y'all ever heard that? My answer back to them is, no, it's not. And they look at me really funny, and I go, heaven's the alternative, and I'm ready for that whenever God wants me. It's, it's thought. It's how do we place our lives? Are we so tied to this earth that we can't go to heaven? You don't know. Nobody knows. It's a split moment. You know, you, you don't even have time to think. And the reason I'm telling you this is if you were to ask me if I had um, if I had the courage to take somebody out, take this life, I would say no. But I was in a situation where my thought was I needed to take out that person. But I have a little grandson that's three years old. And the neighbors, all my neighbors are drugging. And the one, this particular evening, this man was outside, a young man, and I could hear him. He had a pipe in his hand, and he was beating on some metal. And he started cussing at me and my daughter. And the next thing I know, he jumped over the fence, and my first reaction, I told my daughter, my, and I didn't even have, I didn't even have to tell her. She was already running in the house to get the gun, and I was calling them the one. Nothing happened because the law arrived, and he and he ran into the house. But I was prepared to do That's the. If you had asked me a month ago, do you do you have the courage? 
church to take the money out. I would say, absolutely not. Unless you're going to protect your loved ones. It, it, it's one of those things. It's one of those things, though, that we never know until we're put in that situation. Never. And, and that ties into exactly what I'm saying about we have to prepare ourselves. I've been trained to shoot people. I, you know, I, I know where to shoot them. I know how to do it. Um, I was a sniper in the police department up in Plainview. Those things I was taught to do. And my training would, would take over that self-preservation that you're talking about, the training, the thoughts. But again, it's what happens afterwards. And, and so whenever we think about being a Christian and somebody persecuting us to be a Christian, every one of us in here can stand up and say, I will defend being a Christian. I will say I'm a Christian. But we won't know until we're put exactly in that position and, and then we have a, another part of that, which is the after effect of it. Can we live with ourselves? Could I shoot somebody? If it was in click, 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 yeah, my training would take over, and I would do what I've been trained to do. The Lord allows, but, but again, it's how we deal with it afterwards. It, right. I don't and, think I could have lived with myself afterward, but I'm protecting I, I actually had a, a prisoner who went mentally unstable. Um, I got clued in that he hadn't eaten in four or five days, wouldn't get off of his bunk. And I went and I talked to him. He was talking to ghosts. He was talking to the ghost of the people he had killed. And that was his way of dealing with it, because he didn't have faith. I have enough faith that I can look and, and say, this is what I was trained to do. This is what I'm supposed to have done. And, and I think, can't guarantee it because I hadn't been in that position, but I think God would allow me to have peace with that. I think God would allow us all to have peace if we had to take care of and protect our family. And again, I go back to what I said earlier. Whenever I say, I think, better watch what I say. Because each of us deal with it differently. If we deal with being a Christian every day of our life, and we strive hard, we still need to think about, we have it easy. If we're persecuted, give us the strength to continue in our faith. And the other part of that is, let's pray for the people that are being persecuted so that they can have the strength to deal with it. Because I really don't want to be in that group that falls away if we start being persecuted. I want to be in the faithful. And it's hard. And y'all are older than I am. Y'all are more wise than I am because of life. But at the same time, we each build off of each other. We each are each other's strength. And we need to remember that. And if it wasn't for being, coming here, studying the Word, where would we be? And if it wasn't for coming here and discussing life and how we deal with it and how we can help each other deal with it, where would we be? So, anybody else? Okay, let's say a quick prayer to finish the day out, and we'll go on through. Almighty Heavenly Father, great Creator, we humbly come before you today asking you to look down upon us and bless each of us. Lord, we always ask that you keep us strong in our faith. Those that are sick, you will give them an extra touch that they will be strong in faith and that they will know that you are there and in control. 
Lord, we ask that you look upon this congregation and help it to grow, help it to teach others, either here in Monahans or through the work throughout the world that they do. Lord, we ask that you will always keep your knowledge available to us, that we will always be able to study and continue to grow. Lord, we ask that you watch over the many, many, many that are struggling. Help them to come back to you. Help them to find the comfort that you can give and know that you are in control and that they don't have to fight to always be in control. Help them to always know that they have brothers and sisters that are here that can help them and that we need to know that they need our help so that we can go to them. Lord, help those of us that are here that are strong and steadfast. Help us to teach the others, the younger ones and our friends. Help us to always be ready to take your word into the world. Lord, these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.